the third part eh, means eh, after the after the first two that was comprising of eh, how exactly to answer a question. Second was eh, what are the question directives. Eh? The third is eh, where we come to it eh, is some of these critical questions, eh, some of these difficult questions eh, which eh, the students find it eh, very very dicey to understand and even even to answer. We are picking up eh, some of these type of cases in this case, eh, a good number of eh, a quarter century of these type of questions. Eh. The modus operandi is eh, going to be picking up a question. We we'll keep on constantly seeing that on the screen and then uh, how is it that this answer would have been written. The idea is not to give you an answer but to give you a complete outline of how this answer would have been best. What exactly is uh, the examiner looking for in this type of an answer? Is it that the students are able to understand it? Sometimes the students are not able to understand the question and still they go going to write it. Uh, they are not able to understand eh, whether they have to write the topic or they have to write more about the conclusion of the topic here. Eh. They are not able to understand eh, that eh, this question requires eh, a conclusion of sorts to be written first and the introduction to be written later on. We are going to be discussing about most of these aspects. Eh. That is what exactly is the aim of eh, this eh, series, that is the third in this case. Eh. And as we're going to see it repeat it again, it's not essentially from the perspective of or from the purpose of it that it's a complete answer. It is only a directive to the answer. How is it that this answer would have been best written? The contents, of course, it is assumed and is imagined that these students are aware of it. And we are not going to be talking about who gave what, how is it that means. We are only talking about uh, how best can it be represented. The first is present a critical analysis of the theory of isostasy. I repeat that once again, as you can go to see it on the screen as well. There is present a critical analysis of the theory of isostasy. Now there can be two ways in which this question can be answered. The first is uh, talk about all the so-called theories of isostasy and then be analytical of them. Be analytical of them means uh, that is uh, what exactly its merits, what exactly its demerits uh, that is uh, associated with it. That means uh, picking up uh, Airy, Pratt and his canons uh, theory and then what are the merits of it, what are the demerits of it, what are the limitations of it and that will go on to make it simple of sorts. Now that is something that will be written by almost everyone. But this is not what the question is asking. It is specifically asking critical analysis of the theory of isostasy. It is not about the theories of isostasy. It is not about a give a, a critical analysis of the different theories of isostasy. This is not the topic. So, if it is that isostasy has been converted into a theory, then what are its uh, critiques? That is what we have to talk about it in critical manner. So, is it that uh, isostasy, ha isostasy has been converted into a theory? The answer is Yes, how there was one of this first person who talked about it, uh, that is uh, Airy, Pratt uh, and the third person that is his canon. So you have to talk about, uh, generally people will go on to talk about that is uh, what Pratt said, Airy said that it has mountains as roots and that uh, different segments will go on to have the same density but uh, then the depth will be different. Pratt said that all of these segments uh, will go on to have different, uh, different densities and that there will be a level of compensation. His canon combined all of them. This is the theory. Now this theory is not actually valid. What exactly is valid is uh, the phase change concept. Uh, these theories don't going to be having any meaning in the new 21st century geophysical world at all. 
it may be somewhat uh, appeasing to a ragtag geographer that someone can go to write all three of them but this is not the question asked the question now says first you talk about what is isostasy second part is uh, one has to discuss about what are the what what exactly is the theory of isostasy now the theory of isostasy is uh, it allows us to understand why is it that some of these high rising physiographic features exist on the earth exist on the surface of the earth it tries to answer this question why is it not that the mountain is going to collapse on the earth it tries to answer the question eh, why is it that some of these mountains can be very very high and why is it that some of these plateaus will not be high and why is it that plains are plains eh? it tries to answer this question in also tries to answer this question eh, if it is that the mountains are made of low density materials which incidentally they are made of but if it is that they are made of low density materials eh? if it is not that they would have been made of made of low density materials eh, there was no way that they would have been existing on the surface of the earth that was not possible so that goes on to become a theory now it was on this type of a theory that there had been three different uh, view points the first has been that of a airy not exactly in that order airy as we said that is said that mountains have roots uh, Pratt said that uh, different uh, segments of the earth's surface are made of different densities uh, and that there is a level of compensation. His canon said uh, that uh, although different columns are made of different type of densities, that is the mountains of different density, plateaus of different density and so on and so forth, uh, they are all made of different densities. Uh, all of them go on to be having different densities as well and that also goes on to go deep inside the earth. Now, that is one part. The second part that it goes on to talk about of is uh, that the whole of uh, the crust, whole of uh, not the lithosphere. No one talked about the concept of lithosphere. Neither Haskellen, nor Airy, nor Pratt talked about the concept of lithosphere. They all of them talked about uh, that. The, that is that is the crust. Uh. They talked about Sial. They talked about Sima. Now these things are not at all valid right now. So. Why is it that Sial is floating on Sima? Now, when you go on to take this uh, analogy into allowing a lithosphere to be floating on the asthenosphere, then uh, the conditions are going to be very different. Uh. So, Sial is not floating on Sima. That's, that's correct. Uh, and all of them, three of them talked about the same thing. So, the theory of isostasy essentially says two things. The first, that Sial is floating on Sima and any floating body will go on to behave in a specified certain manner and since it goes on to behave in a specific manner in a certain manner therefore uh, it may happen that uh, some of these some of these features that are going to rise very high they will go on to have deep roots and all of those things that will go on to have deep roots uh, will not go on to have very high density they will be made of low density That is what it said. Now, is it that it stands the test of time? Answer is no. First, to begin with, Sial is not floating on Sima. What is happening is uh, that a uh, lithosphere is floating on the asthenosphere, and asthenosphere is not liquid, asthenosphere is not viscous. Eh? Asthenosphere is a solid, but a solid that goes on to flow under a stress. That's one critical analysis. That means uh, whatever that has been said in the theory of isostasy, that is not 100% correct. Second is, indeed, it also goes on to talk about that all of those features that go on to rise, they are made of low density materials. That is correct. Ocean floor is made of basalt. It's not that you go on to find basaltic eruptions say, very high up on the surface. The highest elevation of anything that is made of basalt is going to be in the form of Karakoram mountains. But then Karakoram mountains have been scrapped off. It's not that that has formed. 
basalt has a density of a density higher than that of granite so if there is any sort of a competition between a basalt and granite which one has to rise higher it is always going to be granite it is always going to be a low density material but it is not going to be basalt this is again so partly it is correct partly it is not the third is a uh, when you go on to provide a good amount of a loading on the lithosphere then the lithosphere goes on to sink for example just beneath the mountains and beneath all the mountains the lithosphere goes on to be showing uh, showing a bulge downwards say this is one part other part of it is all of these islands which have been made of the on the oceanic lithosphere they also allow the oceanic lithosphere to bend downward it's not that they going to be flat they going to show a bend because of the amount of a load that is going to be present on that now this is also something that has not been talked about by the theory of isostasy and the fourth is uh, what the theory of isostasy says uh, that is correct that is if you going to put some amount of a load over the over the crustal material maybe sial as well it will go on to sink that is correct so you will going to find that a good amount of a load if it is going to be put on the top of antarctica or if going to be putting it in a the tibetan region then that is also going to be sinking a greater amount of a load will go on to mean that the lithosphere will go on to find itself sinking and when this load is released let's say that the glacier is going to melt then it will start rising in response to the melting and the fifth part is uh, <clears throat> that at the load is going to be put up uh, then lithosphere goes on to compress the asthenosphere and the mantle material that is made of uh, olivine pyroxene and so on uh, and that goes on to compress all of these crystal lattices uh, which is uh, responsible for depressing it so most of the depression most of this load that is going to be put up uh, that goes on to bring about some type of a uh, a change a compactness form of a change in the mantle material that is olivine and pyroxene and consequently that will go on to sink and when this load is going to be released then they will go on to feel themselves released of this pressure and they will go on to allow the surface material to rise now not all of them had been picked up by the theory of isostasy the conclusion then will be the theory of isostasy lay a base it went on to create a base over which uh, most of these modern ideas have been established and they have been they have been put on that is what we going to be the conclusion of this answer second is <clears throat> geology has provided a lot of benefit to mankind from economic perspective but at the cost of high environmental price it is discussed it's not analyzed it is discussed now in this case eh, the question as you going to see that part it has provided a lot of benefit to mankind from economic perspective so the first part of the question is that is it that geology has actually provided a lot of benefit to mankind from an economic perspective answer is yes now how is it that it has been provided Ge what geology goes on to do geology goes on to determine the different type of layers that go on to form it is not associated with geography at all so it is geology that allows us to know whether the different materials that go on to form these things eh, are made of greenstone older greenstone newer greenstone shear zone maybe fault zone eh, maybe certain type of cratons maybe certain type of platforms and so on and then is it that these go on to be repository of mineral resources the answer is yes they are the repository of mineral resources and because they are repository of mineral resources people can go on to explore these mineral resources they can go on to exploit it or use it as well that be the first part of this question <clears throat> so divide this up answer into several portions first says geology let's us know that a the continent is made of every continent is made of different type of layers the first layer beneath is going to be older greenstone belt second is newer greenstone belt 
the third is a going to be the nisic complex with a lot of intrusions of a granite another type of materials and then on the top of it is going to be a sedimentary volcanic succession all of those from the economic perspective all of a, the greenstone belts are going to be very 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 rich in terms of mineral resources in terms of economic mineral resources they are very rich in that and because they happen to be very rich in terms of economic mineral resources and deposits eh, consequently they can be explored so greenstone belt eh, is very rich in iron ore it's very rich in gold it's very rich in ma manganese eh, femg materials gold cobalt copper chromium imagine anything and it's very very rich then all of these intrusions that is going to lead is that we say uh, igneous intrusions eh? along all of these intrusions there is always going to be some type of a metasomatic deposit eh? that means it can be copper as well it can be chromium the third part is geology determines uh, which are going to be the shear zones which are going to be the fault zones like that of Narmada, Son, Damodar, Lineamente. Eh? Now, all along this ligament, eh, there are going to be some cracks that have developed there. Eh. That is, eh, some time back, eh, there have been some intrusions that took place all along in it. Eh, and all of these points of intrusions eh, go on to have a eh, hydrothermal mineral resources. That means the resources eh, which have been made eh, out of a very hot water. And eh, that is hydro, that is water, thermal, that is going to be temperature. So, it is going to be made of real hot water of sorts. Eh. All of this hot water at 1800 degrees centigrade, 1700 degrees centigrade carry a lot of ions and that have been deposited. So, Singum shear zone, Narmada shear zone, Madhya Pradesh shear zone is known for it. The third is, uh, geology also helps us to determine which have been the sinking basins. Uh, like uh, one of these sinking basins uh, which has an uh, enormous amount of limestone deposits uh, is going to be Kadappa. That was a basin that was sinking that as it was found. Geology also helps us to determine the paleogeography of the region. So, the place where Vindhana, there used to be a sea in this region some time back. Yeah. So, most of the deposits that went on to take place yeah, that are going to be limestone and uh, sedimentary deposits. Yeah. Geology also helps, helps us to know whether lava has a uh, lava has flown. And all of those places where lava has flown, like in Malwa Plateau region, Deccan Basalt region, uh, that is uh, going to be a repository of variety of type of crystals uh, like uh, Deccan basalts is going to be known for zeolites. Uh. Ge geology also goes on to provide us uh, information about which are going to be platforms, which are going to be shelf region. For example, Rajasthan and Gujarat has been complete shelf region and complete platforms. Uh. Kaveri has been uh, a shelf region. Same has been the case with Mahanadi. Now, all of these shelf regions and uh, platform regions uh, uh, have been uh, under sea for a good amount of time and there is a thin veneer of sediment over it. These are the areas known for petroleum deposits. <clears throat> now, the first part of this question is over that geology has provided a lot of benefits to mankind from economic perspective. But the cost of, uh, but at the, but at the cost of high environmental price. Now, once you start exploring these resources, then you have to pay an environmental price. For example, the extraction of the materials of a greenstone belt will go on to mean that you have to go in a virgin area, remove the forest cover over that place and start exploring iron ore. Same has been the case with certain things associated with Dharwar region as well, Singhum region as well. You have to remove the forest cover before you can go on to explore these. Second, all of those places which has led to laterite type of deposits like the East Coast bauxites, eh, you ha again have to cover and remove the entire of the forest cover before you can actually go on to reach the lateritic layer which is known for aluminium deposits. Eh. And because they happen to be known for aluminium deposits, eh, consequently, consequently, all of these eh, aluminium deposits eh, can be explored but then only at the cost of the removal of it. Extraction of petroleum will go on to include that you're going to have you're going to use a lot of uh, water resources in that region. You have to make pipelines in that place. Uh, you have to again remove the forest cover in that region. That is again going to be at environmental cost. 
And if you're going to talk about shell deposits, so let's say out of which the whole of the Gansteck region is made of, uh, then uh, this shell deposits uh, also require that the whole of uh, the settlement has to be removed. Uh, and even if you forget about the settlement, uh, so much amount of water has to be used. Uh, and this is going to be pristine water resources that are to be used. Uh, and it will go on to get contaminated because of it. And that is going to be again at a high environmental price. Now, similarly, there can go on to be a lot of examples. We can go on to pick up each of these uh, of copper, of cobalt and chromium and how is it that they are going to be explored and what is the price that you have to pay in this manner. That was second question. The third is, uh, explain the nature and path of insulation is interception and related budget. Again, uh, it looks like innocuous. This topic goes on to look like innocuous. That is, we have to talk about the nature and path of insulation. It's interception and related budget. Now, understanding it from a different angle will go on to mean, not a different angle, but from the correct angle, of course, is not going to be making it simple. First is, what is the nature of insulation? So, insulation refers to incoming solar radiation. It's a form of radiation. From where this radiation comes from? This comes from sun. So incoming solar, that is one that is coming to the earth from the sun. Like most of these forms of radiation, insulation also goes on to be a form of radiation. Now, it is a form of radiation meaning that eh, it can go on to travel in space in vacuum and it can go on to travel at the speed of light. Electromagnetic radiation is what it is. Eh. So it can go to travel at that speed. That is the nature of it. And it can go on to be having, it can go to have all the forms of a spectrum, including alpha, beta, gamma rays, x-rays, and so on, UV rays, all the components of it. So that is going to be the nature of radiation. The path of insulation. Once it moves out of the sun, how is it that it goes on to move? Now, once it goes on to move out of the sun, it goes on to travel in the empty space before it goes on to hit the earth. And uh, it goes on to hit the outermost layer of the earth. That is exosphere and then the magnetosphere. It is in the exosphere and the magnetosphere that the alpha, beta and the gamma rays are taken care of. That is, uh, these layers don't go on to allow the intercept it and don't go on to allow these rays to come on to the earth. Some of them go on to get deflected, some of them go on to collide with uh, the magnetosphere in the upper atmosphere and they cause all of these atoms to transmit energy and they transmit so much amount of energy, these start vibrating, then start glowing. This is what leads to formation of aurora. So, alpha, beta, gamma rays are taken care of by the magnetosphere. Left will be X-ray. X-ray is going to be taken care of uh, in the ionosphere. Left is UV radiation. Ultraviolet radiation is taken care of uh, by the ozonosphere. That is going to be somewhere in the stratosphere and mostly in the chemosphere. So in the chemosphere, as they go on to hit this chemosphere and ozonosphere, that is stratosphere, uh, then uh, then ultraviolet rays are going to be absorbed. So alpha, beta, gamma rays gone by absorb, maybe taken care of, managed by the magnetosphere and the exosphere. The ionosphere manages X-ray. The stratosphere goes on to manage UV rays. <coughs> Left is a, the visible range. It is the visible range that goes on to find itself coming on to the Earth. Now, in some books, it may be written as a short wavelength radiation that comes onto the earth. So anywhere it is written, short wavelength goes on to strike the earth's surface where we live. Anywhere it is written, it is wrong. W-R-O-N-G, wrong. And had it been that the short wavelength radiation would have been striking the earth, all of us would have been cancer patient, walking cancer patient. There wouldn't have been any life on earth at all. So anywhere it is written, maybe here, there, NCRT or any book, that is wrong. This doesn't go on to go with the grain of physics. Eh? Maybe some geographers may go on to like that part. Because, of course, this is not the domain of geography. 
So it comes in the form of visible range. These visible range as they come onto the surface of the earth, eh? in that process they are intercepted by the atmosphere. So that is going to be the next part, that is interception. And this interception goes on to take variety of forms. One of this interception is going to be reflection. Another is going to be re-radiation. Another is going to be absorption. Another is going to be dispersion. Another is going to be scattering. So, as these rays go on to hit the atmosphere, eh, then atmosphere goes into intercept in at least six, seven different ways. Reflects it, absorbs it, re-radiates it, eh, scatters it, disperses it, and so on. And finally, whatever that has been left behind, that comes onto the surface in the form of visible range. It is the property of the visible range eh, that eh, it goes on to show the seven colors eh, as it passes through a prism. That is violet, indigo, violet, indigo, uh, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. And it's not the characteristic of shortwave radiation at all. Now, all the amount of energy that has come onto the surface of the earth eh, or on the earth, eh, considering that is going to be 100 units, and that is going to be talking about the related budget. So, it's going to be 100 units. Eh, then, out of it, eh, 35 goes on to get re radiated back. It goes on to get sort of reflected. Sorry, it goes on to get reflected back. It doesn't go on to take part in the heating and cooling of the earth. Left is 65. Out of 65, 18 is absorbed by the atmosphere and 47 is absorbed by the earth. Out of 47 that is going to be absorbed by the earth, 42 remains on the earth and 5 goes on to get re-radiated back to space. Out of, out of 18 that is absorbed by the atmosphere, 60 finds itself being re-radiated back to space eh, and eh, the earth, eh, the atmosphere has a deficit of eh, something like 42 units. So earth has a surplus of 42 units, atmosphere has a deficit of 42 units. Eh, so a good amount of energy passes from earth to the atmosphere. And how does it go to pass? It passes in the form of infrared radiation, it passes in the form of evaporation, it passes in the form of uh, from one place to another place by ocean currents, uh, it passes through it by heating or cooling of the atmosphere and it it is in this process that the amount of heat transfer that keeps on taking place constantly that uh, keeps the atmosphere in motion. So atmosphere is in motion only because of this factor. That is what the topic was. That is topic number three. The fourth is uh, discuss the shortcomings of the tricellular mechanism of atmospheric circulation. How Palman's model is an improvement over the tricellular mechanism in explaining this shortcoming. The answer has three parts. To begin with, uh, one has to talk about what exactly is the tricellular mechanism. Then, how does this mechanism work? Then, what are the limitations of this tricellular mechanism? And then, how is it that, uh, in brief, uh, of course, uh, Palman's model is an improvement over this tricellular model? So, coming to the first part, that is, uh, what exactly is tricellular mechanism? Tricellular mechanism talks about that on a rotating body, that is earth, eh, how is it that a fluid dynamics behave? That is how is it that the atmosphere behaves? In simple terms, on the rotating earth, eh, how is it that the layer and the envelope of atmosphere works? So one of the ways in which the atmosphere works is that it goes on to break it into three different segments. The tricellular mechanism says that eh, as eh, the atmosphere goes on to form an envelope eh, on a rotating body, what it does is that it goes on to get the entire of atmosphere divided into three different cells. Now, of course, eh, 
it is simply not possible that on a rotating body any fluid will go on to remain in an stationary manner and to go on to have a linear movement that's not possible so three different cells that go to develop include hadley cell that is thermally direct the feral cell that is thermally indirect and the polar cell that is thermally direct the circulation of the atmosphere is all about how is it that the energy transfer goes on to take place from one place to another now since it says that the atmosphere goes on to be comprising of the three cells then the limitation is that first limitation is that it talks about the closed system how is it that energy is going to be transferred from equator to the poles from hadley cell to the feral from feral to the polar that's limitation that's one limitation second is the second limitation is that it doesn't go on to talk about a upper air circulation it or talks only about a the lower air circulation it doesn't talk about the upper air circulation the third is it also doesn't go on to talk about a the different type of a mechanism of the transfer of energy that takes place from the hadley to the feral cell from feral to the polar cell and so on and what can go on to be the mesoscale scale circulation that can go on to evolve the fourth is it doesn't go on to talk about what can go on to be the role of uh, the latent heat in this case uh, in the transfer of this uh, mechanism the fifth is it also doesn't go on to talk about a uh, how is it that uh, the upper air circulation which can go on to take the form of a wave like the rossby waves say uh, they are responsible for inducing uh, some type of movement of the winds on the surface the sixth is it doesn't go on to talk about uh, even uh, the the movement of some of these winds uh, like that of monsoons which are not readily part of the hadley circulation it's a completely different type of a movement so monsoons are a completely different movement and so is the el nino that we call this meridional circulation of the atmosphere it doesn't refer to this meridional circulation at all now all of these limitations have been taken care of by the palmens model of atmospheric circulation so palmens model goes on to say to begin with that well there is a lower air circulation there is an upper air circulation as well so you have trade winds and then there is some amount of movement that goes on to take place on the top of the atmosphere 16 to 8 kilometers of height that's one it also says that a on the top of the atmosphere there is a jet stream that is responsible for transporting excessive amount of energy from the atmosphere from one meridian to another from one latitude to another and goes on to transmit throughout the whole of the earth it also says that the jet stream say moving in the form of rossby waves say are responsible for a dissipating an external extra amount of energy that is going to be in a the in the atmosphere extra amount of energy in the atmosphere through his space eh? that means eh, it goes on dissipate to the space eh, by way of this atmospheric circulation then the the fourth part is that it says that within this circulation belts that is hadley cell within the feral cell so within the hadley cell goes on to form the tropical cyclones eh? these tropical cyclones eh, go on to move eh, from from hadley cell to the feral cell and it is in the course of the movement from the hadley cell to the feral cell they go on to transmit an excessive amount of energy it also goes on to talk about uh, how is it that uh, some of these mechanism can be incorporated uh, like uh, the like uh, the el nino and so even el nino southern oscillation or the monsoon can that can be incorporated into it uh. so all in all the palmens model goes on to many improvement over the tricellular mechanism it is a very emphatic about it can be proven million and million times uh, why is it that the air goes on to move in a form of rossby waves uh, and what can go on to be the role of mountain uh, ranges uh, in the creation and generation of certain type of rossby waves 
So Palmin's model has been improvement over it. That is number four. Fifth question is, uh, analyze the role of mountain systems in weather phenomena, taking example. The question is about uh, the role of mountain systems in weather phenomena. That means uh, we have to take examples in this case. That is the first thing that you have to explain and the only thing that I have to explain is what, the, what is a weather phenomena. So define weather phenomena. Weather phenomena going to be associated with the temperature, it is going to be associated with the winds, it is going to be associated with, uh, with humidity, it is going to be associated with precipitation, it is going to be associated with so many of these factors. Weather, weather phenomena is going to be associated with many of them. It, go, it is a weather phenomena is a, a more or less mesoscale phenomena. It's a it's a it's it's a micro scale phenomena as well. It's a day to day activity. So the role of the role of mountain systems in weather phenomena. That means uh, at a local level and somewhere at a somewhat mesoscale. Now when you're confronted with such type of a condition, you're just going to think of it. Is it that that going to remember the syllabus of climatology? Is it that it goes on to affect the temperature conditions? Answer is no. Right? Is it that it goes on to affect the winds? Answer is yes. What the mountains can go on to do is that, for example, some of these mountains like that of the Aravalis, yeah, Aravalis uh, are uh, responsible for uh, tackling uh, the monsoonal winds uh, coming from the Pacific Ocean. I repeat Pacific, we are talking about the Enso winds, that is all those that are part of it uh, from the Pacific and through Indian Ocean, from Pacific in Ocean to the Indian Ocean and then to the plains and then towards uh, Jodhpur. As they go on to try to go to Jodhpur, these winds are blocked. So the western portion of uh, the Aravalli mountains go on to remain dry. That is how they go on to remain dry. That is one with the phenomena. Second is uh, mountains are responsible for local accentuating local convection. For example, the Uttarakhand flood that took place uh, that took place because of two factors. One was a jet stream was moving over the Himalayan mountain ranges. So when the jet stream was diverging, it was not converging over it, it was diverging. So it was sucking up a lot of air. And uh, in this Himalayan region, as the winds go on to blow upward of the slope of the Himalayas, this air was sucked even further. And that led to what people in general language are going to be calling it as a cloud burst. There is another local phenomenon that takes place. The third is uh, mountains are responsible for, for creation of uh, the windward side effect and the leeward side effect. And associated phenomena like on the windward side, you're going to have a higher amount of rainfall and on the leeward side, that goes on to remain dry. The fourth is, mountains are also responsible for the formation of a certain type of clouds like that of lenticular cloud, alto cumulus lenticularis, that is a type of a cloud. It is also responsible for the creation of the rotor clouds. Yeah. So, lenticular clouds, rotor clouds that are going to be created eh, in the lee of the mountain, they are pretty dangerous in the sense eh, that anyone who goes on to find themselves trapped, they can go on to move up and down and so on and that can go on to collapse. Eh. Mountains are also responsible for eh, creation of eh, some eh, a creation or obstruction of the sea breezes. Eh. For example, the Western Ghats do go on to act in such a manner uh, for the sea breezes that cap comes from the Arabian Sea. So the limit of uh, the sea breeze uh, is going to be only up till Western Ghats uh, in India. It is not going to be beyond that. In some of these places uh, where the plane is going to be completely flat, uh, the sea breeze is able to reach as much as something like some 60-70 kilometers inside as well. Now such type of cities are essentially blessed. Uh, but of course, eh, these cities used to be some places like that of Kolkata and so on, eh, which used to be affected by that eh, till some time. Of course, they are no more affected right now, except in some exceptional circumstances. Eh. Mountains eh, are also responsible for eh, the accentuation of eh, the rains and they are going to increase the rains eh, by accentuating the orography. That has been another component associated with it. 
Now this is a local phenomena, local weather phenomena that mountains are responsible for the creation of it. That is question number five. Question number six has been analyze the different scalar levels of climatic change along with its causes. Now we are talking about Climatic changes at different scalar levels. Analyze the different scalar levels of climatic change along with its causes. Now, this is one of these questions say, that can't be handled so easily because it can't be condensed in 200 and 250 watts. So, all in all, the student will start feeling good about the fact that eh, well, they don't have to write comprehensively and they don't have to go very, very deep inside this type of a topic. Eh. First, you have to define what a climatic change is. Climate change is a, the complete change in the climate of a place on a regional or a continental scale and that has existed in that place for a very large period of time that is about more than about 500 to 1000 years or so. Now that is a WMO definition, it's not my definition. Now, going by this definition, everything that is going to be talked about climatic change is not actually a climatic change. It's a small amount of climatic fluctuation. It's not a climatic change. And that is as per United Nations, as per WMO, not as per me. So, any talk and any journalistic language that goes on to be using this word climatic change is not actually climatic change. And we are indeed, theoretically, scientifically speaking, and internationally speaking, eh, and speaking by way of WMO, are not undergoing through any type of a climatic change right now. Perceptions apart. Of course, eh, from the perspective of perception, you can go on to make any opinion and then you can go on to prove it as well without any type of a logic. So, that is climatic change. Different scalar levels, that means eh, climatic changes are taking place at a micro level, micro scale, at a meso scale, and then at a macro scale so these are the three different scalar levels that means three different scales here at a micro level the changes that are taking place is going to be most visible in the form of urban heat island so urban heat island goes on to take place because the urban areas have a high percentage of area under concrete that absorbs radiation the second is the sky wave factor the third is there are a lot of uh, heat absorbing structures in the urban area. The fourth is that there are a lot of heat liberating uh, phenomena and events uh, and machines that are going to be there like chimneys, like motor car, like air conditioners. Uh. The fifth is uh, urban areas are devoid of vegetation. The, seventh, the sixth is that urban areas don't going to be having water bodies which are going to be generally, generally absorbent of this radiation. So, that is at one scalar level. So, urban areas, people living in urban areas will always go on to feel that eh, something is happening, that the climate is changing. It is bound to be different because eh, living in a concrete jungle is going to be a different experience altogether by living in a natural jungle of sorts. Eh. So, urban areas are going to become a jungle from every perspective. It's a jungle because it's a jungle raj. It's a jungle because it's a concrete jungle. It's a jungle because the people are there, right? Eh? They're going to behave like a jungle people. It's not in the rural area where the people are going to be. Generally, it's very serene. It's very comfortable of a sorts in that region. So that is at a micro level of sorts. Eh? Second is at the mass meso level. A meso level change can go on to be something that can go on to be associated with uh, changes taking place in uh, Rajasthan for some amount of time. For example, the amount and incidence of rainfall over Rajasthan seems to have increased over some period of time. Now, such type of changes cannot be explained so easily. Why is it that it has happened? Why is it that the monsoon shifted towards the Gangetic region? Why is it that the rains have started becoming more frequent in Rajasthan in comparison to whatever that may have been some time back? The third is going to be at a global level. At a global level, the temperature, that is the climate change, changes take place because of its astronomical causes. That is when the earth comes say, to a region in the entire of the galaxy where there is a lot of dust particle so that the sun's energy doesn't go to reach the earth. Second is because the sunspot activity. The third is uh, because of some changes taking place in the sun that doesn't go to transmit so much amount of energy. 
The fourth is because of sunspot activity which allows the temperature conditions to increase uh, to a large extent on the earth. One is astronomical causes. The second is uh, associated with uh, uh, this extra uh, extraterrestrial causes. Astronomical causes can go on to be associated with the tilt of the earth. That means the earth is tilted on this. It can go on to tilt more or it can go on to tilt less. It will go on to cause changes in the climate to a large extent. Uh, and this happens. Uh, that is a uh, that is, uh, the Earth's axis goes into a wobble, wobble like that of a loose tire in a vehicle goes into a wobble. It is also that, uh, that is, the eccentricity of the orbit goes on to change. It is also because of the fact that the obliquity of the axis goes on to change. Now, it is also because of some third cause that is uh, associated with the Earth. That is, uh, one of them is geological causes, that is, uh, that is uh, what happened to India. India was near to the polar region near Antarctica. It broke away from uh, Africa and Antarctica started moving from Antarctica to collide with Tibetan, Tibetan plateau and Tibetan plate. Now as it started moving towards it, uh, there were a lot of changes in the climate that took place on India. First it was polar climate, then it was going to be subpolar climate, then it was a coniferous forest climate, continental continental temperate climate in that place here. Then it went on to become maintenance type of a climate. Then it went on to become a desert type of a climate. Then it went on to become equatorial type of a climate. Then it went on to become again a tropical marine type of a climate. And when it collided with Asia, leading to formation of mountains, it is now a more tropical monsoonal climate along with some small portions of shades of desert in some region. So because of the changes in the geographical position, Climatic change can also go on to take place because of certain type of changes that will go on to take place in some other regions like that of a like that of feedback mechanism. Now, feedback mechanism and volcanic activity. Volcanic activity, for example, one volcanic activity can go to spew so much amount of carbon dioxide that human beings would not have been able to put it in the last 200 years or so. One volcanic activity. It requires only one single volcanic activity that will go on to change the complete complexion and composition of the atmosphere which the human beings have been crying over a small amount of a change there will be nothing at all. It will be something like a teddy bear for them, for the nature rather. Then some feedback changes can go on to be bringing about certain type of change for the whole of the earth. For example, if the Himalayas go on to rise to more than 500 meters, eh, what will happen is eh, in this case, eh, that is, eh, in the process of the Himalayas rising, the snow cover will go on to increase and as the snow cover goes on to increase, the reflectivity will go on to increase eh, and as the reflectivity increases, eh, it will go on to bring about a, a change in the temperature condition. The temperature will also go on to drop and as the temperature goes on to drop, the snow cover will go on to increase more and more, more and more. That is the feedback mechanism. So feedback mechanism can also go on to lead to certain type of change. So we talked about three different scalar levels at which the changes take place. That is what the question was asking. Seventh is, examine the relationship between ocean bottom relief and maritime geopolitics. Now what has to be explained here is not the ocean bottom relief. What has to be explained is maritime geopolitics. So the answer must go on to begin from maritime geopolitics rather than ocean bottom. And then every component of maritime geopolitics has to be added to ocean bottom relief. Now first define what is maritime geopolitics. That is a uh, any type of a politics, any type of a manipulation that is associated with uh, the control of uh, the marine environment that is associated with the control over the ocean say in terms of its resources in terms of its control in terms of its area is what can be called as maritime geopolitics the control over the ocean say are is significant because uh, oceans are now the life root of a uh, and uh, it's a lifeline of trade oceans say uh, are now the harbingers of certain type of uh, changes taking place uh, oceans are going to be the vast reservoir of resources Oceans are one place uh, where you can go on to play hide and seek. Uh. Oceans are one of these places uh, which goes on to provide you with security. And oceans are also one of those type of places uh, which can uh, provide you 
with uh, some amount of uh, change uh, in uh, the way the international community goes on to see with respect to each other as well. So that is what we have talked about maritime geopolitics. Now one of these components of maritime geopolitics is uh, about control of uh, resources. Control of resources uh, is uh, associated with uh, how much amount of a resource that a region goes on to possess and that is uh, associated with the ocean bottom relief. Any country that goes on to have uh, a high amount of a continental shelf and an area under continental shelf uh, and uh, all of those countries that go on to be having the greatest amount of area under continental shelf which has been under water for a long period of a time that means the amount of petroleum deposits is also going to be very very high. That is a recipe for geopolitics. The second is uh, all of these countries that go on to be having a very high area under the continental shelf uh, is also going to be associated with uh, variety of type of marine resources uh, because uh, it is in the continental shelf and a larger portion of it uh, that uh, the that is the marine regions going to be having a very high amount of productivity and that's one part second is it is the it is a uh, uh, again the ocean bottom topography that determines uh, how easy it is going to be for a country to be a blue water navy or not so blue water navy is essentially going to be controlling the entire of the marine areas uh, with the use of its uh, naval power the use of the naval power for the purpose of controlling the oceans uh, is going to be one of these most important factors and how is it that it can be used if you have a series of islands like what india has in the form of andaman nicobar islands eh, if you have series of these type of islands eh, that goes on to make it easy for india to control the entire of the malacca strait with the help of the series of islands that India have in Lakshadweep, it also goes on to become easy for India to control and man the entire of a, the highway of a, highway of traffic that goes on to move from the Gulf of Aden to that of a, from Gulf of Aden to that of a Malacca Strait. It is this island that goes on to become an extension eh, to provide all the type of logistic support to the navy and eh, it is easy for anyone to carry out that blue water navy operation. The second factor in which blue water navy goes on depend is uh, the nature of the coastline. That is uh, whether the coast is going to be indented or it is going to be smooth. If you have an indented type of a coastline like the type of a coastline that we going to have in the western part of the country, western India, then such, an, such a type of a coastline uh, is uh, very very fruitful, very very useful uh, from a uh, variety of angles here. The third is that uh, you can go to create a harbor in that place uh, if you have natural conditions like the type of conditions that is going to present in Karwar in that region. So these are going to be the three factors associated with it that will always go to refurbish a blue water navy because uh, ships can go to move off and on, come back, move and off and can come back as well. That's the second part of it. The third is uh, that is a how is it that maritime areas can go on to lead to the increase in the strength of the littoral eco geopolitics i repeat littoral eco geopolitics eh? that is economic geopolitics eh? so taking an example that is all the areas that are going to be surrounding indian ocean they are going to be going to be very very rich in the near future so if you start taking into account australia from one side, eh, Australia, Timor, Indonesia, Malaysia, and then eh, as you start coming on to Myanmar and so on, Bangladesh, eh, and move towards India, and then Pakistan, eh, and then to the Gulf countries, eh, and then coming to the African countries, eh, this entire of the string is going to be very, very dense in terms of its population. That's one. Second is that eh, it is also going to be very significant from another perspective, that is a eh, <clears throat> The amount of resources that is going to be used in this region is going to be making it a very, very big market. The third is that all of these regions are significant from another angle uh, that is in terms of the type of resources that they go on to offer to the countries. So there is a, an avowed interest for most of these countries to control these areas. The fourth is again about petroleum oil geopolitics. 
there is all of these areas that go on to be associated with the marine regions uh, which have been under marine water for a substantial period of a time uh, have uh, an inherent advantage in the sense uh, that they're going to have a very high amount of petroleum deposits uh, like the entire of the littoral areas of Arabian region some of these portions from the African region as well and a small portion from India as well now that goes on to make it the hotbed of politics the last is the orientation of the sea coast. For example, the way that Gulf of Aden is going to be, the way the Malacca Strait is going to be. Malacca Strait is going to be one type of topography, which is a strait. Aden is a strait. Babel Mandab is a strait. Anyone who can go to have a control over these straits will be able to man the entire of the Indian Ocean. And this is what exactly the US is going to be doing it in that region. They have a, they have a naval base in Sukutra. That is how they are going to be managing that part. And then in Malacca as well, they are going to be having a naval base in that place as well. Oh, sorry, they don't have a naval base. But then India can go to control that region because then the Man Nicobar Islands are going to be very, very close to it. So this is also a part, part of topography of the ocean floor in this region. Ocean floor goes on to, that is, some of these topography features that go on to lead to formation of these isolated islands like Tristan da Cunha. They go on to provide a variety of ways by way of which you can actually go on to <coughs> start manning the whole of the ocean region, like that of Diago Garcia, Tristan da Cunha. Iceland is not one of them, but Askensen is going to be there, Madeira is going to be there. And uh, the colonization of the world started with Madeira. That is when the Spanish uh, first time went on to occupy Madeira. At, it is from that point onwards that it started. Now that is the relationship between ocean bottom relief and that of maritime geopolitics. Question number 8 is about the emergence of behavioral geography was due to the disillusionment uh, with uh, axioms on which models were based and axioms were far removed away from reality. Comment. Now it's comment that means uh, you have to give a firm opinion whether you're going to like it or not. And of course uh, you are not going to be scholarly enough uh, to dislike this statement and going to be going against, its con uh, going against it uh, and uh, contradicting it. Uh. So you have, we are left with no option other than to say that indeed that is going to be correct. So must understand it. That is, uh, the emergence of behavioral geography was due to the disillusion meant with uh, axioms on which models were based and they were far removed from reality. You say that is correct. Now we move ahead with it in this case here. Uh, the answer has uh, three parts essentially. First is uh, the there is a uh, what were the axioms on which models were based? That is one part. Axioms means what were the assumptions on which the models were based? Simplify this question. What were the assumptions on which the models were based? Uh, models means uh, what were the assumptions on which quantitative revolution was based? Because it is quantitative revolution that led to the creation of so many of these models. Uh. And is it that these assumptions were far removed away from reality? Okay. So if it is that they are far removed away from the reality, then uh, is it that uh, everything that was far removed from, away from reality that led to the evolution and emergence of behavioral geography? That is where, what the question is. So coming to the first part, what were the, what is meant by the as axioms on which the models were based? Uh, model and theory building is a part of a, a paradigm in geography that we go on to be calling it by the name of quantitative revolution. So it is quantification that leads to the emergence of a such type of a forms. It's quantification that is actually responsible for the emergence of a, it is a quantification that has led to the evolution of a an idea of a, how is it that models and theories can be built up. Conversion of a, the explanation into quantification, into mathematics, a, of course, is based on a certain type of a, assumptions a, that are associated with simplifying the whole of the landscape. A. So the quantitative 
aspects and the models simplified the entire of the landscape and what are models are models are constructed with an aim to depict certain part of the phenomena not the exact part of it that is a model is an idealized representation of reality not reality it's an idealized representation of reality which is constructed to depict certain of its phenomena <clears throat> that is what the models are so models are an idealized representation of reality which is constructed so as to depict some of its phenomena not all of it so it has to be idealized for the purpose of its idealization you make certain assumptions the assumption is that first the landform is completely isotropic that is going to be completely flat that's one assumption the second assumption is that there is a there is no there is no <clears throat> division in the landscape and that second the third is all the people who want to man it are equally distributed fourth is that people are rational the fifth is that all of these people have an economic motive that means they are robots they just going to think of making money nothing else they are rob robots the sixth is that the income level of the entire of the population is the same the seventh is that there is one form of a transportation and there is only one form of transportation there is no second form of transportation there is only one form of transportation the <clears throat> the fifth is or maybe the next will be in this case eh, there is people going to behave like economic men they are eh, not satisfied they are optimizers now having assumed it is like that you going to assume that let's assume that x is constant so now how is it that the other things will going to made to vary now these were the assumptions so only when you going to make these assumptions then you going to say that is people will go on to move from one area to another area because the cost of transportation is going to be low because you don't have to spend so much amount of money now just think of it a person will go on to move from one place to another place only on one reason and that is because the cost of transportation in movement is going to be low because the cost of transportation in this case is going to be low therefore a person is likely to move from one place to another place agreed this is what quantitative revolution say this is what the model will going to say the models will going to say that uh, people will go on to move from their residence to the office in the morning and from office to their residence in the evening now it hides so many things that's an assumption and this is what the model is so one model is that people will going to go to move to the nearest area the another of this model is that people will go on to move uh, from uh, their home from the residence to the office in the morning from the office to the residence in the evening that's the way that it will going to move does it take place now if you going to be talking about a quantification if you going to be talking about this the model is made but then as this model is made this model is rendered workable people don't go on to move from to their nearest areas always and why should they go to take an example if someone has to move from a Bangalore to Yelahanka or from Yelahanka to Bangalore that will go on to be dependent upon a factors a, like that of a, like that of one how much is the cost of transportation that is one second is a, what exactly is the motive of movement that is if the person is moving from Delhi to Gurgaon or Gurgaon to Delhi what exactly is the motive of the movement of the people is it to buy something and a if they going to buy something from a from from delhi to delhi then the cost of transportation will be less if they going to go from delhi to gurgaon then the cost of transportation is going to be high but what if a, someone is waiting for them in gurgaon with whom they can go on to hold hand in hand and then going to go on to move a, in a, the whole place and they going to come back a, without buying anything at all is it possible the answer is yes it's possible and because it has a possibility and because it is possible therefore what will going to happen in this case is that eh, 
in this case of a possibility in this case of possibility the person will not going to move to the, to the nearest area so person will not going to move from delhi to delhi he'll going to move all the way to gurgaon because eh, there is a shopkeeper who goes on to make him enjoy the shopping in any case eh, and then there is one of his friends eh, of any type maybe girl or boy with whom he enjoys it thoroughly and that the aesthetics of this place is going to be like for him then model stone going to work here at all that means these models are far removed away from reality this is what we are talking about that is a the assumptions on which the models are made the that is a it was because of all of this disillusionment of the quantitative revolution of the models say that they have relegated the space to something that is completely flat featureless surface that has led to the evolution of a the model of that has led to the evolution of behavioral geography so behavioral evolution came because it understood the human psyche it understood why the people going to move which way they do going to move what is the reason for their movement what compels them to move from one place to another place now that is what exactly the question is the emergence of behavioral geography was due to the disillusionment with the axioms with the that means uh, with uh, the impracticality of the assumptions i mean going to say in simple on which the models were based and these uh, assumptions were far removed away from reality of course the fl- fl- land is not flat and featureless of course uh, people don't going to have the same income of course people don't going to be have rationally of course there is not one single form of a transportation of course eh, that is eh, the movement doesn't going to be smooth eh. so these were the assumptions and these assumptions far removed from from reality behavioral revolution took everything into account and it was by taking everything into account that it went on to transmit all of these all of these new changes that allowed geography to be driven in a different direction that is question number 8 question number 9 is a state of economic development of a country is determined as much by the availability of resources as by the secularized process of thinking of the population analyze now when you going to get such type of a question that is a discussion and analyze it the first thing that you have to do is to simplify it both of them were statements and of course this question the answer will going to end with a statement both of these are statements and it will going to end with a statement so indeed the state of economic development of a country is determined by as much by the availability of resources and as by secularized process that means sir economic development depends on two things first the secularized state of mind of the people and second is on resources how much is the amount of resource simplifying it we only says economic development is dependent on the process of secularization that a population has undergone and uh, the amount and the nature of resources that it has analyze it so the first thing they will going to talk about development is the process of enlargement of the choice of the people the more choices that the people going to and to to incorporate the more experimentation that they going to do the more innovation that they going to do the greater the amount of a dimensions that they going to inherent to inherit here and uh, the more they going to think in a completely different manner is what goes on to determine the state of economic development development is not only economic development is economic social its mental psychological its behavioral its political everything so if you going to feel empowered you are developed if you going to feel independent you are you are developed if it is that you have an equality of opportunity you are developed if it is that you have a little amount of money that but it with this money you can go to buy a lot of things in the sense that you are able to do something of your choice then you are developed so development refers to the people development refers to the country development refers to the society all three of them so whether we are able to lead a good life and we have a choice of leading good life is also going to be development that is a part of development it is indeed a part of development 
So how is it that it is going to lead a good life? It is going to lead a good life. We have good amount of electricity available with availability with us. Eh? Good amount of water that is available with us. Eh? A very good civic community that is going to be available with us. Eh? So everything requires that the resources have been eh, available to us. Eh? Not exactly that in some place eh, like eh, in uh, the bare, in, in the barren deserts of Al Azizia in uh, in uh, Tunisia or maybe in the Chad Lake region and around it, uh, you will be able to have this type of a feature. It's not simply possible. It is not going to be in uh, the remote regions of Siberia. It is not going to be in the polar regions because uh, there is hardly any resource that is available in terms of water, in terms of climate, in terms of any of these things that we talk of. So, the development of economy, how is it that you are able to enlarge your choice, choice that depends on the availability of the resource. That's one part. That's there. Second is that it depends on the on the secularized process of thinking of the population. Now, secularization is a process of making you independent, independent of all the worldly things. So it is not associated with religion only. It's not secularism. Repeat it. It's not secularism. It's secularization. That is a process. Secularization is a process eh, of making you feel independent and independent of all the worldly things. Eh. That is, the, the worldly pursuits don't going to bind you together. Rather, you're going to feel completely independent or you make yourself completely independent or you act yourself completely independent as per the needs and the requirements in this case. Eh. So when you're going to feel independent, then you are independent of religion. You can go on to pursue any type of a religion, any type of a faith that you want. So you can go on to be a Hindu, you can go on to be a Muslim, you can go on to be anyone. And you can go on to pursue anyone after. Independence of thinking means uh, you're not bound by the norms of the society. You may not like to get married at all. Largely because uh, the society goes on to say that you have to get married. Independence also goes on to mean that you can go on to, you don't have to follow the pursuit of civil services because that is what will going to make you powerful but that may not going to make you happy so we're going to follow everything that your heart goes on to say what your mind goes on to say and what will go on to make you feel better that is independence independence is also about uh, when you want uh, to work you work when you don't want to work you don't go on to work uh, and that uh, there is a uh, nothing like a foundation on you that you have to do that Independence is uh, something uh, that is going to be giving a choice to experiment a lot uh, and unless you want to experiment, uh, there is no way you can go to bring about innovation in the country and without innovation, there is no way that the country can go to progress at all. Now, all of these aspects, uh, is, all of these aspects happen to be associated with people uh, who are going to be completely non-worldly non in their pursuits uh, of uh, excellence. Uh. So they want to excel, they want to be James Cameron, sometimes eh, exploring the depth of the ocean. They want to be Amir Khan, who goes on to be pursuing variety of type of roles, changing his body as per the needs and the requirements of the role and so on eh, and eh, so forth. Eh. It is going to be all about eh, the type of eh, the roles that Priyanka Chopra can go on to do. It is going to be all about that you're going to mean civil services, leave civil services, start pursuing academics, eh, leave academics, eh, come back to social welfare. It is all about that. Uh, it is all about the teacher of Raghuram Rajan, eh, who is very happy only serving the tribal people in that region. It is going to be all about it. Now, when you have such type of people, only then you can go on to think think of uh, utilizing your resources in the best possible manner. You cannot go on to utilize your resources in any manner other than that. That is the only way you can go on to think about utilizing your resources in the best possible manner. Resources cannot be utilized uh, unless you have an efficient population that actually goes on to help you utilize all of these resources. So. Development is the enlargement of the choice and that depends on the resource availability. But even without resources, let's say Japan, even without resources, the country can be developed. Eh? Largely because the population is developed. Eh? Largely because it's the people who are going to make eh, a hell or heaven out of a country. And if it is that the country is going to be very livable, very smooth to live in, eh, then eh, progress is bound to follow. Money will also going to follow. But more than that, it is the happiness and the enlargement of the choice of the people that will go on to follow. Indeed, state of economic development is determined as much by the resources but more by the secularized state of the thinking of the people. 